Welcome back to DXB Today, where we're talking about navigating the digital maze and artificial intelligence. Now, on that subject, as more Dubai schools are incorporating artificial intelligence into their programs, we are joined next by a visionary principal and CEO of GEMS Modern Academy, as she shares her insights on education leadership, as well as shaping the future of our young minds. Please join me in welcoming Nargish Kambata to the show. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. So, um, here's the thing about AI. I love the fact that GEMS is uh, embracing AI, but I know there has been a problem with schools that the kids figured it out before the teachers did, mm -hmm. and they were doing the homework, they were doing their essays using AI. Was there a bit of a, uh, a challenge there at the very start? So I'm smiling because you represent almost the Gen Z uh, <laughs> group, so you probably figured it out before your, you know, your parents, your adults did. Um, but there's a semblance of truth to that, but I think being responsible for over 170,000 students here in the UAE, um, you know, we take that responsibility very seriously. And uh, I think we've got um, teams right across our schools that are working very, very mindfully on how we equip our children to, to navigate this digital and AI space and maze, because it could easily, uh, easily influence children the way it's not meant to. And uh, if as educators, you know, we, it's our responsibility to figure it out. And I think we've got high powered teams who are doing just that. And we've woven it into the curriculum. We've created projects for them. We've created student clubs, AI confluences where they are creating policy. Students are creating policy for us and we are vetting it. Um, that's the extent to which we've extended um, the learning for our faculty as well as for the simple reason that A, we've got to keep up, but two, we'd be denying our young people the opportunities otherwise if there was that divide and I, I don't personally see that divide at all. Definitely. So can you share with me like how GEMS is using AI in the classroom and what are the students taking away from learning to use AI? Sure, so initially it of course started out with students dabbling and trying to figure out uh, you know, ways around their homework, for example. And um, it is our responsibility to tell them, of course, there's no problem with using AI, but you've got to source it, you've got to quote the source. Uh, there's academic honesty involved, there's ethical principles involved. And um, so not only are we formally introducing students to AI tools, I should flip it the other way around. Like he said, they are introducing us to some AI tools as well. But I think uh, children being children, um, you know, they need to be guided on, on what sort of, um, how they can leverage it and also how they can evade the negatives that come with it. Uh, and I think that becomes our singular responsibility. So I think um, we embrace the opportunity of using AI in the classroom and we use it for everything, for content creation, for generation of images. I mean, they're using DALI, they're using, uh, you know, uh, Gamma AI to introduce the, uh, the, create PowerPoints. And this is the future. So uh, we've mindfully woven it into the curriculum. We've ensured that our academic honesty policies are out in place. We've, they've helped us co-create the AI policies uh, for GEMS. Uh, we've badged some of them right across our schools as um, AI promoters. And um, I think it's, we're in a happy space because when children feel that they're being empowered, um, I think uh, they rise to the occasion. You know, I mean, there's a whole body of work by John Hattie that says that you know, when, you, when you show a child you believe in them, they just rise to the occasion and uh, they prove that they are. So when, when we tell them that we believe you're responsible citizens and we put the ecosystem in place to nurture that, I think that uh, does pretty well. Sounds good. Michael, what do you think? So you had said that you went to the students and you asked them to come up with some of the policies. Were there any surprises? Um, not really, and I'll tell you why. Because I think our students are very, very savvy. All students are very, very savvy. So when we asked them to create a policy, this happened at an AI confluence where there were more than 300 students across GEM schools. Uh, we had partners like Emirates NBD who were there and HP uh, and a whole range of, so it was co-created with the students. And um, I think our students were taken through a workshop on what does policy making involve? Um, what are the pitfalls and what should you look out for? What should you include and what should you not include? And I think once they understood that, um, they worked with industry partners, with teachers, and uh, they created an AI policy for us. Nice. 
Uh, Nargish, I have a seven-year-old and sometimes I joke that I think I need to quit my job and just spend all my time reading school emails. Sometimes it is it is a little bit excessive. I mean, back in the day when we went to school, if there was anything our parents needed to know, we were sent a circular and homework was pretty straightforward. I mean, it would be in our book. We, the next day we will come and, you know, make sure it's done. But today everything is on the app. As much as I'm very for that, sometimes I feel like the 100% shift to the digital world is a little bit tricky even for us parents i feel like kids don't apply themselves as much as they used to anymore what is your take on this so i think our, it was in 2001 that mark Prensky talked about digital natives and this was before the smartphone came out the iphone came out in 2007 and changed our world for us well um i have to say that they would be more comfortable with your seven year old would be more comfortable than you are so you can imagine what the young what the teenager would be um for your generation and for mine, it would definitely be a, a problem. You know, we think of it as an alternate space, but for children, that's just an extension of where they are and who they are. Unfortunately, it's the parents who need to read those emails. <laughs> uh, and I think as educators, we need to flip that the onus back onto the students to be knowing what they're supposed to do. I think we spoon feed sometimes too much. So, um, uh, you know, information is important. Information needs to be, you know, sent out on a timely basis. Um, the digital space is one to be mindfully navigated. I think that's where schools come in again. I, I can't speak for parents, uh, but I can surely tell you that the reason why all that communication gets sent out uh, is to keep parents abreast. We have workshops with parents, and I think parents welcome that. We have young parents, younger than yourself, um, and um, young parents are struggling to navigate the space as well. So we have our counselors conduct workshops with parents to help them navigate that space. Also, some children do uh, look at their devices as an alternative universe and uh, literally live there. And, and so our counselors work very closely with our parents to um, you know, sort of guide them on what should you be doing to get them out of that universe and into their own space. Uh, but I think our children are so, so savvy. And I think when we work together with parents, you know, they say when the, the school and the, and the parent works together, the child is right up there. But when they're far apart, it's the child doesn't benefit at all. So I, I would urge parents to work with the school. And if you have any concerns, bring it back to the school and, and you know sort it out with the school, with the child. Uh, and that's a win-win situation. Well, if you bring it back to the classroom, one of the things with social media is that children nowadays, I think all of us actually, have a shorter attention span. So what are the, some of the challenges that the teachers are facing knowing that they're trying to educate children who are used to losing interest after three or four seconds? That's a great question and I think uh, this is the bane um, because students are skimming and scanning so much um, and therefore the challenge is, is quantified for us uh, because we, for us it is how do you engage this, you create engaging um, you know, activities or you know, um, processes that will keep the student engaged. Uh, and I think if, so if you walk into any of our classes across GEMS, we have personalized learning um, pathways for students. So we are actually catering the content for the student, not undermining the student's ability, but allowing them to move at their pace. And someone may be ahead um, you know, of the curve, um, and someone might be you know, behind, but oh, the, the way the activities are mindfully, the learning activities are mindfully crafted uh, is to allow every child to move at their own pace. Um, and, and that's one. But I, I do want to share that, uh, you know, we have student teachers. Students run a lot of clubs. They run a lot of, you know, programs for junior students. But a particular one stands out where a student walked in and says, um, you know, the, he says, I'm going to teach you critical thinking through physics. And he says, is the Marvel hero more powerful or is the DC hero more powerful? He got, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> he got the, he got the, and you're right, by the way, because when he got them to prove it, using physics and mathematics on speed and power and, and all of that, the children automatically got engaged and, and they didn't know when the, when the class finished. So I think there's something for us to learn there. That is some great input. Nargish, thank you so much for your time and coming on the show. We appreciate you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.